She's the most decorated gymnast of all time. Simone Biles soars through the air with incredible power and strength, but it's also her honesty and resilience that make her one of USA Today's Women of the Year. Welcome to this very special show on USA Today from our studio in Times Square in Manhattan. My name is Zuleika Nethu, and I'm honored to reveal USA Today's 2022 Women of the Year. USA Today's Women of the Year is a 12-month search to recognize amazing and innovative women who have been leaders and champions, many times quietly, but with life-changing results, and often despite their own challenges. Today, we'll share incredible stories of the 11 national honorees chosen for this prestigious honor. Some of them are household names, others may be new to you, but each one has a remarkable and inspiring story. We begin with the American gymnast many consider the greatest of all time, Simone Biles. She has a combined 32 Olympic and World Championship medals. But when she had to bow out of some highly anticipated events at the Summer Olympic Games in 2021, she sparked a much needed global conversation about mental health challenges in sports. USA Today national columnist Suzette Hackney interviewed each of our 11 national honorees. She went to sit down with Biles at her family gym the World Champion Center near Houston. Speak up, speak out, even if you're the only one doing that because it could be very daunting. Legendary gymnast, idol, and advocate, Simone Biles inspires people on and off the mat. You obviously helped the conversation about mental health and self-care, and you've helped so many people, more people than you probably realize. Tell me a little bit about how you felt since then. Mm -hmm. I've always firmly believed in standing on my own, and if I ever put my mind to something, then going after that, not changing who I am. During the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo, Simone withdrew herself from an event where she was expected to win gold, citing a mental health issue. I honestly didn't realize in that moment the impact that it would have. So a couple months later, I have acknowledged everything that has happened, but it still blows my mind to know that it wasn't spoken about before as much as it is now, and we're not open about it, and people don't perceive it the same way as an injury. So I'm happy that we have that conversation. Before that, they only ever said, like, congratulations and thank you for gymnastics. But now with mental health being a huge topic that we talk about basically on the daily now, they're always telling me, like, thank you so much. You've done so much for me and my family, my friends. Now I'm going to go get help. Simone learned her courage from her biggest inspiration. My biggest role model would be my mom. I hope to be half the person she is. She's very strong-minded, strong opinionated. She stands on her own. Everything she's done, she's not only done for me, but the rest of my siblings, and I think that's important, and that's what a mom should do, but I feel like she's really gone above and beyond to put us all first and for us to be able to do what we love. What role do you think women have in the change and progress in society? I think besides our voices, we're just always pushing the envelope forward. And I think that's really important, not only for us to realize as women, but for kids to see that, that women can do anything men can do. Every woman has something special to give. What advice do you give to those girls out yeah. there or girls who mm -hmm. aren't in the gym, but still right. need that guidance? I would say find your passion because once you find a passion, that's when everything falls into place. Whether that's school, work, athletics, whatever it is, make sure you have something outside your realm that makes you happy, makes you keep going, and that's your passion. And Simone is currently in the middle of wedding planning. She announced her engagement to NFL player Jonathan Owens in February. Our next honoree has consistently made the Forbes list of most powerful women. Melinda French Gates co-chairs one of the world's largest charitable organizations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. USA Today's Suzette Hackney sat down with the philanthropist, author, and computer scientist. Here's that story. We have a 
fabulous list of Women of the Year. Um, you honorees are inspiring, and um, I'm just really glad that we get to do this in mm. person, so thank you. Me too. Global advocate, philanthropist, and icon Melinda French Gates has spent years serving others, but credits her earliest role models to where she is today. Who has kind of paved the way for you in this world? My parents. My parents totally paved the way in the world for me and my three siblings. So there were four of us. Uh, we were a very middle income family in growing up in Dallas, Texas. We knew my dad's engineering salary wasn't gonna put us all through college, but my parents said you should all be college going because it's your ticket to whatever you want to do in life in the United States. And we, your parents, are gonna take on that debt. That was an amazing message to give. And so my parents set up a separate small real estate investment company. We all worked in it. We did things like I mowed lawns as a kid. I cleaned apartments with Easy Off in the oven. I mean, we were all deeply invested in this real estate investment company because that was the money that was gonna put us through college. And that's an amazing thing as a young person to know that your parents believe in you and that you can go anywhere, but that they're also gonna pave the way for it. What was your relationship like with your mom? Oh my gosh, my mom is my everything. You know, she was a stay-at-home mom by choice. However, once my parents set up this real estate investment business, she would work on that all day. Like there were so many things to do. You keep the books, you have to go do this, you have to meet a tenant. And yet, my mom was there for us kids. I still look back and marvel and I wonder how she did it. I remember many times coming home from high school in the afternoon, just either exhausted or not sure what I was doing or crying about something. And my mom would pull up at the table and I still love iced tea, my kids tease me about it. She would make us each a glass of iced tea and she would sit down and talk to me and make it okay. What advice would you give your younger self? Mm. I would say to my younger self, like when I was 18 and graduating high school, heading off to college, you know yourself. You know yourself far better than you may remember later. And if you always stay true to this self that you are today on your 18th birthday, you're going to be fine in life. Melinda is on a mission to help women use their full voice, their power, and their influence in society. What do you think about where we are as women mm, right now? Mm. Where we are, how far we've come, how far we have to go? Well, in the United States, you know, if you interview people, they think we are 50 or 60 years away from equality in this country. And the truth is we are over 200 years away from equality. When you look at all the measurements of how do you say when somebody's reached equality. So I think we've made enormous gains as a society, for sure, for women the last 100 years, right? But I don't want to wait 200 years. Empowering women and creating equity is at the heart of Melinda's mission at Pivotal Ventures. I've met so many incredible women around the world through my travels. I'm lucky enough to travel. And so it's a passion for me to figure out, you know, how do we help these women lift themselves up out of poverty? Because what I know about women is that when you invest in them, they invest in everybody else. They lift their kids up, they lift up their community, they lift up their society. And so I get a lot of passion and excitement when I see women who are becoming empowered. Most of all, Melinda wants everyone to share their gifts with the world. I want people to know that no matter who you are, you have gifts and gifts to give back to the world. And I think sometimes people see me in the position that I'm in now because I am a global advocate for women as, oh, she's always had it easier. It's not like that. You do have to work through these moments of courage, right? You do have to have people around you who, who put you out there and say you can do it. And what I want to say to people is, if somebody has given you a chance in life, somehow pay it forward. Just pay it forward. You have so much to give to other people. And I think sometimes we underestimate that. We think, oh, well, only when you get to that position of power can you do that. We know we can all create change for each other. French Gates co-founded the Giving Pledge in 2010, a promise from the world's wealthiest people to donate most of their money to charity. 
It now has more than 230 participants from 28 countries. From one innovator to another, Linda Zhang led the team that created Ford's all-electric F-150 pickup, the first one of its kind. In fact, people told her it would be impossible. So naturally, she made it happen. The chief engineer designing the future of the F-150 is as tough as the all-electric Ford she created. Tonight feels like a dream come true for me. It's a dream that started when I was eight years old and rolled in a car for the first time, just after my family moved to America to start a new life. Linda credits her parents for following their dreams so she could have her own. I came to the U.S. when I was eight. My dad was um, a student at Purdue University, and my mom came with and got her master's degree. Both of them worked really hard. They held down multiple jobs while at the same time being at school and raising me. So for me, having experienced all that, I've watched them and all the things that they did. I think a lot of that has really made me who I am today. And when she wasn't revolutionizing the way people drive, Linda also focused on work-life balance. I try not to overthink things. So for me, it's actually been a journey for the last couple of years as we've worked on this really awesome EV truck. And at the same time, for me, it was important to have a family and um, be there for my family. And that to me is probably the most important is to know that they know that if they needed something that I was there, but at the same time, they're very proud of all the things that I've been able to accomplish. Good morning, guys. Hey, how are you? So this F-150 prototype is all electric. And we're gonna be towing 10 double-decker freight cars weighing over 1 million pounds. She took on what some thought might be an impossible challenge, create an all-electric version of one of the most popular trucks in the world. For us, you know, uh, we're trucks, so we can do it, right? So now we're at 1.25 million pounds. Yes. That's kind of the mantra that we have is, we're gonna make it work. We're almost at the finish line, I can yeah. see it. It's just how do we get there? And some of it is, do we have the technologies to do it? And we do in this case. That's awesome. Oh, that's that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> yes. We did it. It was awesome. It felt like being a superhero. So we got some speed behind us. We could feel the torque being applied and it was a lot of fun. And when she wasn't revolutionizing the way people drive, Linda lives by a simple motto. I've always had one, and that was just be happy. Um, for me, I think, you know, a lot of, especially growing up um, less fortunate and having come to the U.S. without a lot of money, I think a lot of it is just, you can be happy regardless of where you are. You just have to take what's positive around you and really do something with it. Zhang has been with Ford for about 25 years. So Women of the Year actually began as Women of the Century. In 2020, we want to recognize um, women who had made such an accomplishment over the past 100 years. Uh, we were celebrating the passage of the 19th Amendment 100 years prior, and we wanted to talk about the women who had made such a difference over that time period. At the same time, we were beginning to see other lists come out uh, quite often about the most notable this or the most influential this or the most powerful this. And so many times they were populated by men, mostly white men and women and people of color were around the edges. And we wanted a project that would center women and women of color in the amazing accomplishments that they have made to our history over the past 100 years. So we got together and we decided to name 10 women of the century in each state and then 10 nationally. But what happened was we could not decide on 10 nationally. There was too many women that we wanted to talk about over the past 100 years. So it quickly became 100 women of the century. Even then, there were so many names that couldn't make that list. So what we heard when we published this was, wow, we had no idea. We had no idea. Um, these women have inspired us, they've, um, they've, they've educated us, they've empowered us, and we had no idea that they existed. So we wanted to expand on that. So the next year rolled around and said, it's not women of the century, but we can certainly every year do women of the year. We can talk about the women who've made a difference to our society, to our technology, to our culture, to our education throughout the past year. And that's what we're doing in this special and in this project is we're recognizing the 2021 Women of the Year. And I can't wait to introduce them to our readers and viewers, and I know that you're gonna be as inspired as I am by their stories.
The goal of the Women of the Year program is to make sure that we continue to honor and elevate and amplify the voices of these incredible women. We'll do this every year. We're gonna be talking about women at the state and local level, women at the national level who are making a difference. Um, we want to make sure, again, their voices are heard, their lessons are learned, their ideas are amplified, and we wanna make sure their ideas are accelerated. We have a very unique platform in USA Today with our immense um, audience, our immense reach, that we can spread the word and the knowledge of these incredible women, and I find it an honor that we get to do so. In 2021, Admiral Rachel Levine became President Biden's Assistant Secretary of Health, making her our nation's highest ranking openly transgender person, and the first such person to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Her history-making appointment is not one she takes lightly. She has big goals for her legacy. Women are often the creators of change. In terms of the changes that we see in our society, in our culture, I think that women are those change makers. Admiral Rachel Levine is a groundbreaking leader, public health champion, and an advocate. She credits family support for helping her get where she is today. My father has passed, but my mother is still alive, and she is quite the, uh, the, the role model. Uh, she is a retired attorney. I've always been motivated by, uh, by those who work uh, for, the, for the benefit of others, and that's what I try to do. Last year, Rachel made history, becoming the first openly transgender four-star officer across uniformed services. And raise your right hand and repeat after me. I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. And it is truly my honor to serve as the Assistant Secretary for Health and truly my honor to be an Admiral in the Public Health Service Commission Corps, to be the first transgender individual who is an Admiral in any of the eight uniformed services. And my goal is to give back. Part of giving back is Admiral Levine's message to the transgender and non-conforming community. The message here in Philadelphia, in Love Park, is that trans rights are human rights. You have worth. You have tremendous worth just for who you are, no matter who you love, no matter who you are, no matter what your gender identity, sexual orientation, or anything else. And to be true to that, and then everything else will follow. And it highlights something which I truly believe in, which is the value of diversity. Diversity is just so important in our culture. It's important for our country, for the world. And so we really need to welcome diversity and actually celebrate diversity for what it brings to us as a nation and what it brings to us globally. Admiral Levine wants her work to be a shining example for all. With the COVID-19 pandemic and the other challenges that we face, public health is more important than ever. The pandemic has taught us, like nothing before, how interconnected we all are. The personal decisions that we make influence our families, our communities, our nation, and the world. I really feel that everything I've ever done, again, whether it was in academic medicine, in education and clinical research, seeing my patients, in my role uh, in public health in Pennsylvania, and now my role nationally, has all led to this moment. And she plans to meet this moment with courage and integrity. My definition of courage would be to be true to yourself and to be true to who you are, and then to pay that forward to work towards the common good. Janet Murgia's own experience of the American dream saw her start in a one bathroom house with eight other people to the White House, working with President Bill Clinton. The civil rights activist has dedicated her life to breaking down barriers for other Latinos in the U.S. The one mantra for me that has been my guiding principle is a word in Spanish. It's called adelante, and it means keep moving forward, keep pushing forward. For me, internally, it means never give up. After experiencing the American dream firsthand, Janet Merguia is opening the door for millions of American families. She's president and CEO of Unidos US, 
the largest national Hispanic civil rights and advocacy organization in the United States. The heart of our mission has been to improve the lives of individuals who are represented in diverse, vulnerable communities, but in particular, the Latino community. But we're very focused and believe that we can seize the moment in collective with our brothers and sisters in the African American community, the Native American community, Asian Pacific American community, to really reset how people see those communities that are often denied access or have faced barriers because of the color of their skin or their culture. It wasn't acceptable back in 1965, and it sure isn't acceptable today. Janet didn't have to look far for the ultimate role model. The obvious role model for me as I was growing up was my mother, Amalia Murguia. There were nine of us in a tiny house in Kansas City, Kansas, in one bathroom, and we found a lot of strength in the values that she and my father instilled in us. But Amalia Murguia sacrificed a lot. She worked so hard and provided for her family, looked out for the neighborhood children, and instilled in us a strong sense of family, community, and faith. Today, there's some question about whether the American dream can still be within reach for everyone, and it's a legitimate question. But their belief in El Sueño Americano was real, and they worked so hard to try to make it a reality for their children. That reality set in when Janet worked under President Clinton and her parents were invited to the White House. I'll never forget, as we were just outside the Oval Office, um, my mom had tears coming down her face. And in Spanish, you could hear her whisper, ¿Cómo llegamos hasta aquí? How did we get here? She was so nervous, excited. And then just as we were at the door of the Oval Office, my dad made a beeline for President Clinton. He stuck his hand out and he said, Mr. President, thank you for giving my daughter this opportunity. And President Clinton put his hand on my dad's shoulder, my mom's shoulder, and he said, you know what, Mr. Murguia? I hired your daughter, and she walked you in here. But you're the ones who got her here. To have my parents experience that moment, and to be in the Oval Office with the President of the United States, and for him to acknowledge their sacrifice, their hard work, it's an unforgettable moment for me, and I know for my parents, it was a special experience. Janet is taking her past, applying it to the present, and planning for the future. Nobody achieves leadership roles and accomplishments on their own. Having a vision, mm -hmm. dreaming big dreams, I know it's daunting right now, and we face some very dark times, and there's real challenges, but I believe it's so important to encourage young people to try to move through this darkness and keep their sights set on a bigger dream, a bigger vision for themselves, for our, their community, and for the country. Janet is not the only Murguia sibling to achieve success in serving her country. Her twin sister, Mary, is a federal judge. One of the most exciting parts of the Women of the Year program is the investment in the next generation. The Gannett Foundation is proud to partner with Girls Inc. to provide a $25,000 grant to celebrate the work Girls Inc. does to advance the women leaders of tomorrow. Dr. Stephanie Hull, President and CEO of Girls Inc., shares how this grant will help further their mission. We are a network of local organizations who work with schools and in communities across the United States and Canada to help girls prepare for their futures and reach their full potential. Our evidence-based programming is proven to make a measurable difference in girls' lives. We also work with and for girls to advance their rights and the opportunities that they need through public policy and advocacy. Girls Inc. serves 134,000 girls ages 5 through 18 each year in the 350 communities where our affiliates are located. We've been doing this work since 1864. About 80% of Girls Inc. girls identify as girls of color, and about two-thirds of them are living in poverty. 
Their communities often lack access to safe and supportive schools, sports and extracurricular activities, college and career preparation, and economic mobility. They don't always have opportunities to explore and develop their talents. With all that's going on in the world, too many of them don't even have a time or place to let their guard down and just be kids, except when they're with their Girls Inc. sisterhood. That's why ensuring that girls have strong mentoring relationships is a critical part of our work. Our professionally trained staff and volunteers provide continual care and guidance to girls and their families. Girls are born leaders, and they have the ideas, the creativity, and the talent, but they need our encouragement and they need guidance to develop their voices and become strong, independent women. We should all find a way to reach back and mentor someone wherever we are on our own journey. We believe in the power and potential of every girl. When girls are surrounded by people who believe in them, are encouraged to set high expectations, and are given the opportunities and experiences they need to learn and grow, they thrive. Girls Inc. is building a new generation of leaders. Girls are innately powerful, but racial, gender, and social inequities shut them out of opportunities to thrive. Girls Inc. makes a measurable difference in girls' lives. Evidence-based programming sets girls up for lifelong success. Girls lead change in their lives and affect change in the world. Invest in girls. Invest in our future. Visit girlsinc.org to learn more and donate. Inspiring girls to be strong, smart, and bold. In addition to the five women we've heard from, USA Today honored six other National Women of the Year. Here they are. It's a simple act of making sure that people who generally are not heard or people who are generally not understood are taken seriously. Just putting one foot in front of the other can be such an incredible triumph. Stand tall, stand straight, speak your truth, no matter what is coming at you, no matter how many arrows you have to your back. The healthcare industry needs leadership and they need it now. Always try to think about doing something because it's the right thing to do. Even if you are different, in that difference lies your power. Women are creating change in their communities every single day. They don't have a national stage like Simone or Janet, but they're lifting one another up in big and small ways. It's these selfless individuals we honor in our series, Womankind. The women of Womankind are mentors, business owners, teachers, mothers, friends. They're changing the world one act, one business, one relationship at a time. Right now, we introduce you to Shirley Raines and how she's making Los Angeles a little more beautiful, one soul at a time. Shirley Raines and her team may wash and cut hair on this corner every Saturday, but they're looking to transform much more than a person's appearance. People look at the fact that we do hair, we do makeup, we apply eyelashes, and they're like, how do people feel when they get out the chair? Like, what do they what do they do when they look in the mirror? Are they a man? And you know, it's such a six of one, half a dozen of another experience because they are smiling in the mirror. They are happy with what they see. But I'm not convinced that most of that comes from the eyelashes that they see and the lipstick that they see or the hair that they see. I think a lot of that comes from somebody just giving them that time and attention. Every Saturday, somebody takes the time to make 20 and 30 minutes of them. That alone will boost your self-esteem. These things, they still matter to us. You know, we still care about how our, we, our appearances, no matter what, like if you're low income or poor or not, like, so it's a blessing to have these services because we probably wouldn't get it otherwise. It all began when Shirley realized she had to make a transformation of her own. Back in my 20s, I lost my firstborn child. He passed away five days from his third birthday, and I came down with massive panic and anxiety disorder many years after that. I do have five more living kids, but my life has just never been the same. That trauma, that tragedy at such a young age really broke me. And I think when I was 48, another anniversary was coming up. He, he was born on September 11th. He passed away on September 6th. So September is kind of my, my, my hard month. And I think I called my sister, and I was crying again, and she was like, okay, you have been been doing this for almost 30 years he would not want you to live like this you have got to process process through this you know she's like I'm sorry this happened to you but you gotta you gotta find your purpose Shirley Shirley volunteered to help feed the homeless in Los Angeles and when I went 
it was amazing. Like, I loved it, but the women were more interested in my hair and my makeup, the LGBTQ community. They were like, oh, we love your earrings. We love your eyelashes. We love your hair color. I was like, oh, thank you, King. Thank you, Queen. And I probably went three weeks with this organization. They kept saying the same thing, but see, the narrative I had been fed about homeless people was like, they need clothing and food and all these things. So I was like, do you want, like, hair color and makeup? Because I can bring that. And they were like, yeah, if you'll bring it. I'm like, oh, sure. I got all this stuff at home. Before she knew it, word spread that Shirley was bringing beauty services to the streets. They started calling me the makeup lady. Everybody knew my car. Everybody was looking for me. Today, Shirley and her team provide a variety of services. We are feeding 500 of those people on Saturdays and 350 of those people on Tuesdays. I have a lot of work to do because I need to be able to feed all 6,000 of them. The numbers are probably closer to 8,000 right now because more people came um, since the pandemic. They just want to help do what they can to help where you're at in your life, like as far as needing like hygiene items and things that help keep um, COVID down, like they give us hygiene, sanitary, things like wipes, laundry detergent to do laundry around here. Shirley sees a reflection of herself in the people she helps every weekend. You know, the loss of my son, and many years later, I buried his dad as well to an early stage of colon cancer. Because of all the trauma that I had been through, I too kind of was an ugly person to society. It was a lot of hurt, it was a lot of pain, it was a lot of anger, it was a lot of rage, it was misplaced indeed, but people thought I was just like, like people gave up on me. And I learned that just because someone looks a certain way or they act a certain way, it's not really what it seems to be. And I know a lot of pain and a lot of hurt can look like rage and anger. Shirley plans to bring healing and support to her community for years to come. Beauty to the Streets does not want a building. If someone offered us a building, I'd tell them to take it and make it home, you know, housing for the homeless. If they're on the corner, we're on the corner, you know. If they're over here, this is where we are. We meet them where they're at, in their own backyard. Meet all of the incredible people featured in this series on usatoday.com forward slash womankind. Every year we honor women who are advocates for equity, inspire change, and give everyday women a place to see themselves. If you'd like to nominate a woman for USA Today's Women of the Year project, go to womenoftheyear.usatoday.com. From our USA Today studio in Manhattan, I'm Zuleika Nathu. Thanks for watching.